dedicated to restoring responsible citizenship in our student body by ensuring that all students have a meaningful voice and a substantive opportunity to get involved at the University of Alabama. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Norman um, Baldwin, in a, who is a prof professor in the Department of Political Science. Former WUVA <laughs> News Director Jordan Laporta will be monitoring Twitter for us and will ask your questions later on in the debate. The United Alabama Project Director of Political Advocacy, Joshua Shumate, will be keeping time tonight. Now we'd like to thank Dr. Baldwin and Jordan for helping us out with this event. I will now give an overview of the rules and format of tonight's debate. We will begin the debate by giving both of the candidates two minutes for an opening statement. The order in which the two candidates give their opening statements will de be determined before the debate by drawing straws. The order in which these answers are given to the questions which follow will rotate from question to question. When opening statements have concluded, three predetermined questions will be posed to all of the candidates. Each candidate will receive three minutes to give a response to these questions. If a candidate is mentioned in the answer of another candidate, he or she will be given one minute to offer a rebuttal. The moderator will have full discretion to offer or not to offer these rebuttals. When each of the questions have been posed and answered, the three candidates will be asked for each individual response. Rebuttals to the individual candidates will only be allowed if another candidate is mentioned in the answer. The moderator will have full discretion whether or not to do that. After answering their individual questions, each candidate will be given the opportunity to ask a question of one of the other candidates, which was pre-prepared in advance of tonight's debate. Candidates will have two minutes to answer these questions. There will be no opportunity for rebuttal. However, these questions, the questioner will, if they see fit, have the opportunity to ask a single follow-up question to the other candidate after they have answered the initial question, for which the responding candidate will receive one minute to answer. All three candidates have been instructed to prepare questions, which are substantive and not to prepare a question which is personal or deflammatory in nature. After the candidate questions, the moderator will ask one final question to all the candidates and the remaining time will be used for audience submitted questions. At any point in time in tonight's debate, any member of the audience may submit questions to any specific candidate or to all candidates via Twitter by tweeting at the United Alabama Project. Candidates will be given two minutes to answer audience questions and will again have the opportunity to request one minute for rebuttal following an answer from the opposing candidate if they are mentioned. If your question is directed to a particular candidate, please include the candidate's <coughs> initials at the beginning of the tweet. When there are 30, minutes le 30 seconds left in each answer or rebuttal period, the time period and timekeeper will hold up a sign denoting the time remaining as a warning. When time has expired, he will hold up a sign that says stop to inform the, inform the candidate who is speaking. Each candidate has been permitted to bring a single sheet of notes with them. Prior to tonight's debate, questions asked to the candidates have been reviewed only by myself, Josh, Jordan, and Dr. Baldwin. Once again, thank you everybody who came out tonight. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Jordan, who will be introducing the candidates. Let's get this thing started. Our first candidate is a junior from Harvest, Alabama, Mr. Patrick Fitzgerald. <laughs> Next is a junior from Vestavia Hills, Alabama, Ms. Caroline Morris. Sophomore from Montgomery, Alabama, Miss Lillian Roth. So now, Miss Roth, you will have the first opening statement. You have two minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, y'all. I'm Lillian Roth, and I'm running for SGA president. 
I'm a sophomore from Montgomery, Alabama, majoring in public relations and political science. And during my time at the Capstone, I've been honored to be involved in a variety of different experiences. I've been active in the Honors College through the University Fellows Experience, as a student in the Blackburn Institute. I've played on the club sports team, and I've been very active in my sorority. Through those different experiences, I've come to realize the importance and the need to value every student's perspective and have everyone come to the table to get to know each other and understand those experiences and perspectives in order to move on together, move forward through our campus. I want to run because I'm tired of the party lines and the tensions that have been brought up through this campaign by my opponents. I'm excited about talking about my tangible and achievable goals, rather than what we stand with or who stands behind us, but rather what we stand for. I'm excited to use this debate to explain to you the remainder of my platform and to really show you why I deserve to be the next SGA president.
And my big initiative this year was the color line. We raised a ton of money for needs-based scholarships. But in doing that, we, we missed the opportunity to include students in the process. So I'm gonna create a student empowerment grant that invites you into the process and actually uses our money to fund your ideas so we can get behind you and together we can make this campus a home. questions. Uh, we're going to continue to circulate the order here, and so Senator Fitzgerald, you'll answer the first question first, it's followed by Senator Roth, and followed by Senator Morris. So, first question, Patrick. For years now, campus politics has been plagued by scandal after scandal involving the machine. In the last five years alone, five separate SGA scandals that in some way involve the machine or machine candidates for SGA office have garnered national media attention to say nothing of the disease segregation issue in the Greek system or the machine's incursion into the local school board election in 2013. Recently, though, Argentum, a campus secret society made up of predominantly independent students, has grabbed the attention of students and has been accused of supporting candidates in SJ election. Okay, now there are three parts of this. First, do you as a candidate take a position on campus secret society? Second, Additionally, have you ever been backed by the machine or Argentum for an SJ position, including this one? And thirdly, what do you plan to do about these recurring ethical issues in campus politics? Number one, I say for any secret society or underground organization, come above ground, legitimize, because there is no part in secretism on our campus. When you hide things, when you keep people out in the dark, it does no good. And that's when you brew anything that's going to oppose democracy, whenever you have things in the basement. And no, I've never gotten an endorsement out of the basement. I've gotten my endorsement out of the grassroots from people. And at the same time, you want to say, what are we going to do about it? I think we need to push the administration to recognize the machine. They know good and well it exists, and they ought to recognize it. And we need to come forward and tell people that we are not going to allow you to practice in that way. And one of the things we need to endorse is the partisan is the partisan reform. We tried to put through in Senate this last time. The faculty Senate put it through. We've seen where party systems work and they're legitimate at other universities. And we need to make sure that all students on this campus have a fair place to be able to organize and get involved in SGA. We can send a clear message, come out of the basement or we'll bring you out of it. Senator Roth. Yes, so I will never stand for voter intimidation or voter coercion. So of course, when that's associated with any underground organization, I would urge the administration to take any steps necessary to fight um, such issues on campus that we obviously are aware of. And like I said in my opening statement, I will never stand for party lines that continue to divide our campus. I think all it does is bring more tension and more divisions in a campus that desperately needs our unity and our advocacy for the need to be united as a campus in order to move forward together to that progress. Absolutely. A big part of why I'm running is I want the way and the purpose and how I run to reflect my promises that I make to you while I'm up here running. And in that, I think, as both senators have echoed, that party lines have been a very divisive issue on our campus, especially ones that are underground, not registered through the source, and there's no tangible means of accountability. I know through my experience in working with um, the machine in the past, I was a machine-backed senator in the past, um, how not everything is above ground, not everything is transparent, and oftentimes people are intimidated. And so it's not fair to say that that does not exist on our campus and that those are not real issues people face. And when I am running, I wanted it to be strict, strictly not associated with any party lines. I wanted it to be about me running a campaign for individuals, elected by individuals, because we can believe that our campus is for all students when our leaders believe they can be elected by all students. And it takes courage to do that, it takes bravery to do that, but more importantly, it takes you to do that. We can move this campus forward together and keep our campus out of the media and out of, these, out of all the criticism that we face on campus when we stand up for what we believe in collectively, united. And that is why I want to run, and I mean, I need you to do that with me. Um, as regards to am I backed by any organization, no, I've never, I'm not backed 
by a secret society for this election. I acknowledge it happened in the past, and I denied that backing for this election for the specific reason of moving our campus forward. <laughs> Now, basically, it seems like everybody who is uh, interested in politics on campus uh, is under the very strong impression that you are backed by Argentum and that you are backed by the machine. So, what do you say? And, uh, how, is everybody wrong on campus to think that Argentum is supporting you? Is everybody wrong thinking that the machine supports you? You know, I would say that I have had overwhelming support from the Greek system. on the issues of race on college campuses, both across the nation and here at UA. For example, the Supreme Court is currently deliberating over Fishes versus the University of Texas, a case concerning affirmative action policies in the college admission process at the University of Texas at Austin. As we know, at the University of Missouri, campus protesters were successful in seeking the removal of both the University Chancellor and the President of the University of Missouri system for what they characterized as failure to adequately address racial issues on campus. Here in Tuscaloosa, the We Are Done movement has successfully lobbied the administration to set up an intercultural diversity center, the first administrative effort to promote diversity and inclusion in UA's history. Do you have a plan to promote intercultural acceptance and fellowship across racial lines, or at least to decrease racial tensions on campus and if so, can you articulate it now? Jim, do you have a plan to promote intercultural acceptance and fellowship across racial lines, or at least to decrease racial tension on campus? And if so, can you articulate it now? Absolutely. So we're at a pivotal time on our campus right now to where students' voices are being heard and we are moving forward and progressing with diversity and inclusion on our campus. And that is something that I want my role in SGA, both in everything I have a say in NSGA, as well as my voice as a student in advocating for this prog progress to be represented through my position. As far as SGA goes, we do a lot of talk up here about making our campus more inclusive and more diverse. But if you look at the processes of how SGA works, it bars students from being involved to begin with. Right now, appointed positions, which makes up the entire executive cabinet, you have to know someone in executive council, essentially, to get an appointment. It's based off of who you know. And the first thing I want to do in office is open that up and make it to where every student can apply. And what that does is that ensures that you don't have to have a right connection. We're getting the most qualified students in office to advocate for issues that they are experts about and ensure that our SGA is the most knowledgeable and able to articulate for these issues. We have established the Multicultural Affairs Division of SGA, and it has not been codified yet. So I will codify that and make sure that it is a lasting part of our organization. I've worked with the Black Student Leadership Council in establishing their toy gala, and that is something that I will continue to do. And more than that, I will advocate as a student and as president for a division of diversity and inclusion at the administrative level. That is something that we are the only school in the SEC that does not have, right, have that right now, and that is something that we need in order to unify efforts for diversity and inclusion on campus and have clear communication between all the moving parts of diversity and inclusion on campus. Yes, and I think that we need to first off realize that not much social progress on this campus comes without people organizing, just like we're done. It doesn't come without people having to fight for it. 
And the same thing can be said that we wouldn't have integrated sororities right now had people not taken the steps of Rose. We wouldn't have a multicultural center right now had people not taken the steps of Corpus. And I think we need to continue to push forward with student activists to make sure that this is the most inclusive campus that we can have. And one of the ways we need to build on diversity and inclusion is by making sure that we have a permanent space of an Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs. Make sure that it's somewhere centrally located and make sure that they have the means and they have the resources they need to continually put events on. And when they can advertise to their events, make sure that we can bring in, say, groups that normally don't get together, like NPHC groups, maybe with IFC groups, maybe with the conservatives, maybe with the Democrats, and get a kind of cultural mesh that that office was intended to have. And at the same time, make sure that there's a place on campus for any freshman that's not in a lettered organization that they have an open door that's welcoming them to come to because we really don't have that many other places. So first, make sure that we have an Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs that is always working for people. Second, we need to push forward for campus progress. And we need to ensure that we're working with activists, we're working with administration to rip the names of eugenicists and slave owners off our school buildings. And people might say, and people might say that's a race in history. But at the same time, it's not a race in history because the things that those people did is never gonna be erased. They can't go back and erase that. We just have an option as a university whether we're going to continue to glorify that in a year 2016. And I don't think we should. And at the same time, too, you've got a lot of people that are going to say, oh, that doesn't, you know, they're, they're getting riled up. That doesn't affect me. But most of those people that say that are not in the community that are most affected. You have to think about the amount of times that people come on campus and the history that people hear. Whenever you see a slave owner's name and you're a black student that's taking a Bama Bound tour, that's not an open door for you. And we need to make sure that we have a better look. And I agree, we also need to make sure that we have a permanent division of diversity and be not only the last person in the SEC to have one, we're also the last person in the Alabama system to have one. UAH and UAB have one. It's time for us to catch up in the 21st century. course it's kind of the same thing everybody has to take or if it's something that's basically being offered in all sorts of different colleges uh, according to their disciplinary frame of reference uh, what do you think do you think the university ought to require every freshman that comes to this university to, to take a course of diversity and inclusiveness okay. uh. I would say absolutely um, 
One of the most transformative courses I've taken at my time at UA has been Sustained Dialogue, led by Lane McClellan, which is centered around diversity and inclusion, but not just implementing a curriculum for students to understand, but allowing students to be involved in the process of understanding the challenging details and issues surrounding diversity and inclusion and learning from different students' experiences and making it very personal. And so I would advocate that every student have not only have the opportunity to take sustained dialogue and a diversity and inclusion class, but be required to take it their freshman year as they are getting to know other students on campus and as they start to make friends and connections on campus and figure out their place on campus so they have a well-rounded view of what our campus is that they may not have gotten um, when, from where they grew up in high school. Yeah, I think we should definitely implement that because you've got the way you combat tolerance is educated, or intolerance is education, excuse me. The way you foster tolerance is through education and showing people, opening people's eyes and understanding where we come from and that we're a lot more alike than we are different. And so I'm a huge fan of having an, a, a required diversity and inclusion class, definitely. I'm in favor of being one before you come to Alabama, whether it be like Alcohol EDU, and I'm also in favor of making it a part of required curriculum. That's one of the big reasons why I'm supporting <coughs> Alex as Vice President of Academic Affairs, because that's something straight off of her platform. And that's something that I'd work with her on and any other SGA senator that would put it up in the next year in order for us to codify the class and put it forward. Okay. Senator Roth. To echo um, my other opinions on stage, of course, I think we have to have a class for freshmen regarding diversity and inclusion. And furthermore, I think we should take it outside the classroom and advocate in the different organizations on campus the need to understand different perspectives and different experiences. Because without that, how are we ever going to learn from each other and grow together as a campus? Okay, the third question for everybody in the uh, order that we'll take this in is, is Lillian Roth first, then uh, Pat, uh, Caroline, and then Patrick. Okay, in the past few years, there have been a number of concerns presented regarding sexual assault. Studies show that one in five women, one in five women, will be sexually assaulted while attending college. The SJ recently spearheaded its On Us campaign to bring awareness to campus sexual assault that many are still calling on the university to do more to address this issue. Do you have a plan to address the sexual assault epidemic on this campus? And if so, what does it entail? Again, do you have a plan to address the sexual assault epidemic on campus? And if so, what does it entail? So the It's On Us campaign was a wonderful campaign led by Jordan Forrest that helped to spark those conversations and begin the dialogue to raise awareness of the sexual assault on our campus and nationwide. And yes, I have a multifaceted approach and plan to combat the sexual assault on campus. The first being advocating for Uber or a similar ride-sharing provider to come to the Tuscaloosa community. I think that's the only way we can begin to um, offer those options to help students really not only expand their quality of life, but of course their campus safety. There's too often a time that specifically females need a ride home from maybe the library or maybe a party and have no other option. If the university or the community is not able to continue advocating for Uber, I would, of course, love for the administration to look into expanding the 348 ride and making that more accessible or reliable for our campus. Um, second, I would love to implement a more sustained bystander intervention program. Currently, there is a Haven, an online course that students are able to take, but I would love it to be um, an in-person seminar that organizations need to facilitate and go through in order to be registered by the source um, as active members in the community. And third, I think we need to advocate for expanding the resources and the um, awareness of what you can do after the fact, if necessary, of course. I would love to work with the Women and Gender Resource Center in order to expand that and make it more visible and well-known to the women that might need that, um, of course, in case of sexual assault. Like I said, it's a multifaceted approach, and I'm willing to sit down with the administration until we're able to see these programs and these initiatives to their fullest potential on our campus. Ms. Morrison. While serving on exec in SGA this year, Jordan Forrest and our exec team did implement It's On Us, which was did a fantastic job of starting the conversation about sexual assault and raising awareness. And what I want to do in office is take that awareness that we've created on campus and move it into education and action. 
Right now, a big problem associated with sexual assault, whether it is overtly expressed or implied, is victim blaming. And the biggest way to combat that is through education. It's not through making campus, well, making campus safe is important, but that's a campus safety issue, not necessarily a sexual assault. Student scholarships, after racist, from Alabama's history, divisive, and contradictory to your mission and the mission of the SGA. All right, well, I will say, first off now, talking about Jim Folsom, Jim Folsom was actually the first governor in the South to come out for full integration in the 40s. So that's <laughs> We're talking about Little League Boss, and this is a big year of women empowerment, so we should be in favor of that. <laughs> and thirdly, I guess, you know, John Spartan, you can say a couple of things about John Spartan, but at the end of the day, he came around on all of those issues. And also, too, if you look, yeah, if you look at it as well, but if you look at it as well, that bill was endorsed by no other than the Tuscaloosa chapter of the NAACP, and they had no problems with it. But at the same time, I do think that we need to have an open dialogue with students, and if we need to change any of the measures, I'd be glad to just change it to Houndstooth, Crips, and White, or something generic like that. But if the NAACP didn't have a problem with it, and nobody, no We Are Done activists had a problem with it as well, I think it's something that's fine. <laughs> Well, actually, when I was able to sit down with Dean Hexon, the Dean of Students, he 
he clearly was not aware of that, so I'm confused why the Dean of Students wouldn't know. But I was able to sit down with him to move forward on how I, as SGA president, am going to help make that happen for every student. I don't think any mistake that happens your freshman year specifically should hold you back from maximizing your opportunity at the capstone, and furthermore, when you're applying for those internships or graduate schools. I'll continue to advocate for a SAM forgiveness program because I believe in the potential of every student at the university.
kind of win tomorrow. But of course, if we do have to make it to a runoff, and if for some reason I'm not making it to that runoff, I would have to decide who I would support. And I can honestly say that I would support Caroline Morrison. We've been good friends through the Blackburn Institute and through the University Fellows Program, and I respect her and her decisions. I still believe that I'm best suited for this job, and I think that I genuinely care about uniting this campus, regardless of party lines, more than anyone else on this stage. But if, time, if it came to it, I would support Caroline because I believe that her ideas are a lot more tangible and realistic than my other opinion. Okay, I think we're now we're going to turn it over to Jordan to do a little question and answer. So before I turn over the mic, I'd just like to say I think we've got a terrific group of candidates. Out here. And I'm really proud to be a part of this university, and uh, I think that UAP has also done a terrific job tonight. So positive answer. Thank you, Dr. Paul. I appreciate it. So now it's time for the Twitter questions, which have, believe it or not, been almost as brutal uh, as some of the questions that have been asked tonight. Twitter has shown no mercy. Uh, and so uh, for each of the candidates, there's been kind of a recurring theme in each of the questions that's been asked individually for y'all. But I'm going to go ahead and start off with a question for all of you to answer. You'll have two minutes, right, Josh? to answer this question, so uh, all of you will get a chance. And so that question is something that came up a lot yesterday as well during our executive position debate. And this question is, do you support priority registration for student veterans and dependents using GI Bill benefits? Uh, and we'll start with who's turn to We'll start with Patrick and just go down the line. Sure, I agree 100% that we need to have priority registration for our veterans. And it's not just because they've served this country, but it's because of the way that the 9-11 GI Bill is set up that you have to be able to get your services on time. And whenever you have it where, the longer it takes for any veteran or any dependent to get their services, the harder it is on them. Because if you have countless stories we've heard of throughout the campaign cycle, and people go through this each and every day, where if they don't have their classes confirmed, they have to live on their savings to get by over the next couple of weeks. And that's not any kind of position that we should be putting better on this campus in. Thank you. Priority registration for veterans and dependents is a huge part of my platform, something I've worked on while involved in SGA and something I plan to continue to work on if elected as an SGA president. I see Tyler Hoback sitting in the back as the chairman of the Student Veterans um, Council. And I worked with him while meeting with administration this year to advocate for veterans to have priority registration on campus. We, six <laughs> states, it is legally required for students to have priority registration, um, for veterans to have priority registration on campus. And it is ridiculous that Alabama does not have this when it's seen as a federal requirement for so many states. A lot of schools are adopting this practice because it puts unnecessary financial burden on our student veterans um, as they wait on the months from December to February for their GI Bill to be approved. And that's something that we have the responsibility and the ability to correct. And I feel like that is something that is very important to me and it's something that um, we should be advocating for through our presidency. I'm the only candidate up here who has been endorsed by the Veterans Association um, and by Veterans in Business because of my work that I've done with veterans in the past and because they believe that I'm the best candidate to continue to advocate for their needs um, and advocate for priority registration on campus for our student veterans. So I certainly believe as well that veterans and dependents need a priority registration on campus. Um, and to go a step further, I think that we need to give them a seat at the table, whether that be through my president's council or for various task force, where we can invite veterans to come to the table and discuss with me or the future SGA president what they need and what they see as the most important issue to them on campus and what the SGA can do to help solve those problems. I want everyone, like I've been saying all night, to feel included and feel safe on this campus. And for anything that I can do to help make the veterans' time at the capstone better, I would love to continue advocating for it, of course. So now there are uh, some individual questions for each of you, and I'll just continue to go down the line like I did the first time. And once again, there have been a lot of questions asked repeating the same themes for each candidate. And so Patrick, one of the things that a lot of people on Twitter are wondering about one of your platform planks is alcohol in the stadium. And many people have very snidely pointed out 
uh, that there is an SEC regulation on this, not just a University of Alabama uh, restriction. So what would you say in regards to people questioning the practicality of that plan? Sure, as far as practicality goes, I think that <laughs> where are we going to start? I mean, you're never going to see a repeal on a policy if you don't get the conversation going. And that's what we're doing right now, by starting the petition to garner, to, to garner support, not only on our campus, but across the Southeastern Conference. And the way that we're going to, what did you say? Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking to me. No. <laughs> And this year, people think that it's not possible. We've had AL.com covered it, we've had Fox, we've had ABC, NBC, and CBS now. And those people are from reputable places, and they wouldn't be giving this any kind of attention if they didn't see that there was a possibility. The Southeastern Conference for far too long has been sitting back, and we have been ignoring the success that this has had at several other places, whether it be campus safety, whether it being leading to a decrease in alcohol-related arrests on game day, and game day arrests as a whole have gone down 35% at West Virginia University. We need to quit putting people in compromising positions on game day. You got too many people taking eight, nine shots feeling like they're Superman going into the stadium because they can't have anything to drink when they go inside, and that puts people in inherently more dangerous situations. The SEC needs to get on the same level as Troy in the Wiregrass because they do this successfully. Everywhere that has tried this has seen a decrease in game day related arrests, and they've also seen a huge rise in revenues. This is feasible. We've actually been talking to SEC uh, SGA presidents from different colleges that are going to be in favor of this and are going to push this forward. We can do this. And you know, as far as it goes, there is not a machine rep that wouldn't like to see alcohol in the stage. I'm going to tell you that right now. And I know that as soon as this politics gets over with, I want to go down fraternity row. I want to go down in the FERG. I want to take from the FERG, and I want to get as many people to sign this petition and work across SEC aisles to make sure that we present this as a true need on campus, which it is. Now, Treasurer Morrison, I have a, a question for you. A lot of people have been asking about the power to the people uh, event that you worked with, and specifically talking about the cost and benefit of this specific event. A lot of people want to know uh, what was the cost versus how much was actually raised of this specific event. Absolutely. So um, the Power of the People event is something that we were really excited to have in SGA this year. We've had several different need-based scholarships fundraisers in the past. Oftentimes, we need the date option. I don't know if y'all remember that. Um, but as a woman, I find that slightly sexist and a little in questioning um, Title IX laws. And I feel like our administration had um, similar sentiments. And so one thing that was very important to me this year was establishing a sustainable fundraiser for our needs-based scholarship fund that we could implement year after year and could grow year after year. And so I spent all year working with our SGA exec and with our team to establish the Powder to the People Run, which was held um, two weekends ago and was very, very successful. We are still working on calculating net profits, but we do know that it was profitable. Um, we are we're waiting on the Toyota to confirm how much GP actually donated to the race. Our net revenues were $10,000. Our expenses total incurred from all the excluding sponsorships were $8,000. So we're looking at a total profit of $2,000, but what we do have is that, um, I mean, UP has contributed and pledged uh, sponsoring up to $6,000, so we could be looking at anywhere from $2,000 to $8,000 as a revenue gained from this run. Now, Lillian, a question that's been posed to you is, while you've been in the Senate, uh, what legislation have you sponsored or written to help prevent sexual assault on campus? So one piece of legislation that I was very um, advocating for and very excited about was less about sexual assault necessarily, but more about improving police relations, which I think would help open the door and the conversation to uniting the uh, campus with the Tuscaloosa Police Department to work on creating the sexual assault prevention programs that we need to have. Um, I was able to sit down with the Tuscaloosa Police Chief Anderson to discuss what we could do to work together with the community and with our campus in order to decide what's best for our students to help begin use that dialogue and those conversations to improve sexual assault prevention programs on campus. Uh, Dr. Tim Hepson, you know, our dean of students, he's incredibly supportive for students 
has been in favor in the past and still is of student activity fees because he sees the utility that we have there in being able to pool our resources together and unify as one student body and really dictate where our money goes, dime by dime. And as far as it goes, anybody that says that we don't need to be paying for 250 students to eat every day, any student that says that we don't need to make sure that hunger isn't a day-to-day -day part of someone's life at the capstone, isn't somebody that's ever struggled with finding their next meal. It's not somebody that's ever been more worried about their next meal than studying for their next test. When it comes down to it, we need to look at the overall advantage that we have as students. It's a matter of you have a choice. If you were coming home from the strip for a late night, right? You had the option to go to Moe's, get you a quesadilla, get you an extra queso. That probably run you with a drink somewhere in the ballpark, twelve dollars and fifty cents a year. And so you've got an option then, students on this campus. Do I either pay for this, or do I put the money back in my pocket, go home, and not eat for one meal, but ensure that two hundred and fifty people eat for an entire year at a school that is in the heartbeat of the Bible Belt? And somewhere where we pride ourselves in taking care of our own with Southern hospitality, we ought to be better than that. And we ought to see the true utility of the spirit of Alabama. I'm not going to sit up here and uh, say that anybody's going to argue against starving students because that's that's a tough thing to argue against. But I think what a lot of people have a problem with maybe is the precedent that something like this sets. Like your Spirit of Alabama Act right now, if it passed, would yes only be twelve dollars and fifty cents the cost of a meal at Chipotle or Moe's. But what if other student governments in the future wanted to expand this door that you seem to want to open? Sure, absolutely. And one of the things we're going to do with Spirit of Alabama this year is throw a cap on it whether that cap be somewhere, I think, in the ballpark of $20. And we want to make sure that we are issuing the point that, yes, we're addressing issues that are on campus now, but we need to understand that there are some issues that are going to come that have not presented themselves yet. And we need to make sure that other SGAs will then have the power within that $20 range to be able to raise the funds to be able to combat issues. As far as it goes, making sure uh, that this is going to be something that's not abused, the first time that we write it is going to be this spring, and it's going to be in Bill but then thereafter, in the spring of the next year, it is going to be a constitutional amendment. It's going to be set in stone, and you can't have SGAs go in and manipulate it unless they have 67% of the Senate to throw it on the ballot and 67% of the vote in the general election. This is something that we can ensure is going to be not only sustainable, but fair in the future. Now, Caroline, there is something that uh, a lot of people have pointed off, uh, pointed out on Twitter uh, as something that they see as a bit of hypocrisy, and I'd like to get you to weigh in on that. So, you are currently the SGA treasurer, a position that is appointed. Uh, you last year very publicly campaigned for Elliot Spillers, one of the people that helps appoint that position, and you're also in the University Fellows Program with Ben Leak, who's the current. Vice President of Financial Affairs. Do you think it's a tad hypocritical to now want to switch to a merit-based appointment system when you might have benefited from the connections that you have from those two people? I don't think it's hypocritical. I think it's responsible. I think that through my experiences with SGA, I've seen how I've benefited through a system that is not entirely fair, and I think that shows a lot of my integrity and personal character to say, hey, this might be make my job harder, and it might be harder on me, and it, maybe I wouldn't even be here, but this is what's fair, this is what's right, and this is what we as the student government are called to do to ensure that our processes for the student government are fair and are right and are accessible to all students. So no, I do not think it's hypocritical whatsoever. I see it as a need that I've seen on campus through my direct experience and involvement through SGA and one that I am more than willing to correct, even though it creates more work on my end and even though it, you know, is I mean doesn't benefit me, it benefits students. And so Now, the follow-up I have for you regarding that is at the end of your statement, you just said it creates more work for me on my end, which I think I think everybody can agree with having a, a thorough vetting process is, is a good thing. But there are a lot of people that are concerned with the timeline 
that this might impact the allowing the, the appointments process to go forward in this way. How would you see this plan affecting the timeline of appointments uh, in a part of the semester that is very crunched in terms of SGA time? Absolutely. Um, we actually have a, applications for other appointed positions lower in SGA. It's for all of our director positions, which is a lot of positions. It's way more than 14 members on an executive council. It is around uh, anywhere, it's around 35 positions. And so what that means is that A, it's not going to be that much of a time constraint. B, it is our responsibility as SGA to ensure that our practices are most fair. Um, even though that does create more work, it's our responsibility to put in the extra work. And more than that, um, it's it's not going to create this undue time. I think we all remember Chisholm um, being appointed last year and how long and drawn out of a process that was and how still able we were allowed to, or still as SGA we were able to um, accomplish a lot as an administration even though the appointment system was drawn out and I can promise this is going to be a lot quicker and smoother of a process than that because it is so straightforward, transparent, open, and accessible. <laughs> Now, Lillian, the, the question that has been asked of you has been the most asked question submitted to Twitter, uh, and it's been the same question over and over and over again, and you've been asked it tonight, and I asked you a couple times uh, in the interview that I didn't do personally, so I'm going to ask you one more time. Uh, are you or are you not a machine candidate for SGA? Uh, a lot of students have pointed out saying specifically, quote, support from Greek life is not a sufficient answer to the question. Uh, so, are you or are you not a member of the machine? I will answer by saying that my biggest problem with campus right now is that that's the most asked question. I think <laughs> I think what 
part of the responsibility as president is to conduct student, student surveys that are widespread to understand the student body's opinion on this as well. Um, but in regards to safety, our UAPD does a great job of keeping the same campus safe, and there's other campus safety initiatives and measures that we can enact and can, the SJ president actually has the jurisdiction to enact that it does not include um, carrying guns around on campus. Well, in regards to this issue, of course, as SJA president, I'll be a voice of the students and a voice to the administration. But what is more important to talk about in regards to guns on campus is expanding the mental health resources necessary. Um, for the mass shootings that Patrick was able to touch on, or the students that you know don't need to have a gun on campus, we need to first address the mental health and the stigma attached to that that we face every day on our student camp, um, the students on our campus. What needs to happen in regards to that is not only expanding the um, options and the resources available in the FERG or the Student Health Center, but we really need to help continue the conversations that were sparked at the End the Stigma campaign and turning those conversations into action. Because the only way we can move forward on that discussion is first establishing a more firm base on the mental health discussion. So with that, that's going to conclude the social media question portion of the debate. We are now going to move on to closing statements where each candidate will get a minute and a half each. First up will be Caroline Morrison, followed by Patrick Fitzgerald, and then we'll end with Miss Lillian Roth. Caroline? Voting is tomorrow, guys, and your vote absolutely matters, and I really want to encourage everyone to vote for the candidate that they believe in and that they see as the best president for the University of Alabama. I am running because I believe that my platform is tangible. My experience is the most experienced of every candidate up here because I have had that executive experience and I've been able to see the inefficiencies of exec and how we can continue to progress SGA and make it relevant and impactful in students' lives. Um, I want to be your SGA president and I want to do it in a way that I believe in. And that is because I want every student to be able to have a voice in this process. And we've all talked about giving students a seat at the table, but I want to do more than that. I want to give you a role in the process of SGA. And that is evident by my platform, that is evident by how I'm running, and that is evident and a testament to by who I am. Um, both candidates have touched on how important unity is on campus, and I have full confidence in saying I'm the best representation of that, considering both candidates said that if they were not elected, they would want me to be elected. Um, campus is very polarizing right now, and it is time for campus to move to, or to move forward together, and that requires having people who are able to work with people of different beliefs, different backgrounds, and different parties, and that is something that I can do, and that is something I want to do, and that is something that I want to do with you. So voting is tomorrow, and I would very much appreciate your vote for SJ President. I think this is a time in the SGA that we need to make sure that we're electing people that are not going to make always popular choices, but that we're going to elect people that are going to make right choices. And that's something that I promise you that I'm going to do. And I know that times are going to get tough. I know that things are going to get controversial in this next year. But the times that I excel the most are not when there's a sunny day. I excel the most whenever times are tough. It's whenever things are most rugged. And I promise you, you're going to have somebody in the SGA that's actually going to address issues as they are. We've got a choice. This was the 100 year anniversary of the SGA. And this next year as we go forward, we have an option. We're either going to vote to make sure that SGA continues the same practices of the last 100 years, or that we're going to make sure and have an SGA that works for all 37,000 students in the next century of service for the SGA. And that might be by making tough choices, by having some shared sacrifice, but at least we're addressing issues that are going to actually give people an SGA that they can have an interest in and get something out of. And why I'm running? I'm running because we don't need to be focusing on issues that were going to affect us five years ago. We don't need to focus on issues that are going to affect us now. I'm running because I've got a great faith in this university. And I don't want to send my kids to a place where they're going to have to hear the same damn speech for somebody talking about what are we going to do about the hungry on campus? What are we going to do about the disowned? What are we going to do about everybody left in the dark that isn't going to get the help they need? This is the year to do it. And I promise you that we are not going to have anybody left behind in an SGA that I'm in charge of. So first, I want to thank all of y'all for coming out tonight to not only become more informed voters, but to really get to know us as candidates and understand what we stand for and what we hope to do as your SGA president. I also want to thank the 
and I Valley Development Project for hosting this platform for us to be able to share our ideas and our vision for campus. You know, I really see the vision of our campus as a unified, unique, and strong student body. I hope that with my idea of the President's Council, where everyone will be giving a seat at the table, where everyone will have a first-hand opinion and look into what we hope to do as a student government association, I hope that that's going to be the next step to moving the University of Alabama forward in the right direction. My ideas are not only tangible, they're achievable, they're realistic. And I hope that every single one of y'all understand that tomorrow on Election Day and votes for me, Lillian Roth, to be the next SGA President. Tomorrow's the day, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. on My Bama. I know myself and everyone running is running so we can have your voices heard on campus. And so make sure to have your voices heard through your vote in the election tomorrow. All right, whenever you're ready. So tomorrow's election day. Let's just make sure and get out and vote. Regardless of who wins, who loses, if we have a high turnout, everybody's going to win on this campus. Vote tomorrow on My Bama because your vote counts and every voice is important at the capstone. Um, party lines aside, it's so important to vote tomorrow. Tonight showed that we have some strong candidates running. All three, Lillian, Patrick, and Caroline, exhibit some great leadership qualities that I support. It's so important for you to exercise your right to vote your conscience tomorrow. Um, whether you vote for Lillian, Caroline, Patrick, get out and vote. Your, vo your voice matters.